All right. Well, I guess I'll get started. Um, thanks for thanks for joining me tonight. Thanks for having your meeting a little early so that I can go to bed not too late. I really appreciate it. <laughs> My name is Anne Marie Fovell, and I am uh, the tech team coordinator for the Be Informed Partnership. But before I started working with BIP, I was a college professor, and uh, I was teaching environmental and sustainability studies. And more specifically, anything with to do with foods and food systems. Um, and it is, of course, through that journey with food and agriculture, growing it, um, that I became acquainted with bees. I stumbled upon bees. And I then had the opportunity to open a colony. Um, and I think that many of you can probably all uh, relate to this. It's, it's a pretty amazing experience. And I totally fell in love. For me, it was like, you know, love at first sight. It changed the course of my life. I mean, not only that I'd become obsessed and, and, and um, started beekeeping, I was challenged in ways like I had never been before. So I kept on trying to learn more and more and more. And then I changed my research focus at the university that I taught at. I brought bees to the campus and I started participating in the Sentinel Apiary Program, which is one of the things that I will talk to you about tonight. Um, and that program was run by the Bee Informed Partnership. Um, there was a commercial in the old days that used to say, I like the product so much that I bought the company. I don't know if you remember that, but in my case, I, I like the service and the effort so much from the Bee Informed Partnership that I left my job and I went to work for the Bee Informed Partnership full time. Um, so even though the Sentinel Apiary program is not the program that I run that I am directly involved with. I'm in fact involved with the technical transfer team program, which is um, services to commercial beekeepers around the country. And uh, in particular in California, we work with the queen breeders in the, in the Northern California region. And of course we follow all of our beekeepers uh, throughout the season, which means we all end up in California in February for the almond bloom, of course. So, um, tonight, I do want to talk to you about the Sentinel program, however, because I do think that it probably relates to you a little bit more. And you can definitely learn from this program whether you participate in or not in it, or you just can go and look at the data that we have on this program. So we'll look at all of this. Um, so before I worked for BIP, I was a Sentinel user. And so tonight, I'm going to talk to you about the Sentinel program, but more in the perspective of a user rather than somebody who works for BIP. So hopefully you'll get something out of it. Um, so let's get started. <clears throat> yep, let's get started. Next slide, please. It's not working. That's fine. Okay, there we go. So, um, just really quickly, I'll let you know what the Big Informed Partnership is, just in case you haven't heard from us. We're a very small but impactful nonprofit organization. Um, and we're headquarters, you know, mainly from the University of Maryland, but we're really all over the place now. Our executive director is in Colorado. I'm in Michigan. Our grant writer is in Canada. One of our IT guy is in Colombia. I mean, we're everywhere. Um, so our reach is fairly broad, however, because we have a big extended family. We work with a lot of bee research labs in across the country, lots of universities, but also with commercial beekeepers, with backyard beekeepers, with sideline beekeepers, and also with uh, the beekeeping industry. So anything that relates to, you know, equipment, products, um, anything like that, we work with them as well. So um, our main mission is to improve colony health. And we do this by supporting beekeepers, bridging the gap between science and industry. And in the process, we became the largest repository of colony health data in the United States. You, so some of the programs that we run um, are, you've probably heard of our National Loss and Management Survey. Uh, most people have heard of it and you know, take it year after year after year. We've changed it this year. It was a lot shorter. Um, it was focused on queen management this year. And so <clears throat> the National Loss and Management Survey is what started BIP. And uh, we got a big grant from the USDA to run this survey. And then from there was built the Be Informed Partnership and then became a nonprofit afterwards, continuing to work with everybody else. So when you see data in the news, you know, so many colony losses, 40%, 33%, or whatever, that always comes from the Be Informed Partnership National Management uh, Survey which is different from APHIS, but we still work with them too. 
Um, we have the Tech Transfer Team Program, which I told you about that works with commercial beekeepers. And um, we do field trials, we have IT products, um, <clears throat> we do emergency response kits and diagnostic kits and that sort of stuff. And we run the Sentinel Apiary Program, which is mainly for um, uh, backyard beekeepers and some sideliners are using it too. So before I get started with all of this, I guess I want to ask you a few questions, just in case you're not so sure you should be staying here. I'm not really selling a product. I will talk, tell you about a program that does cost money, but it is a whole lot more than that. It's, it's collecting data, colony health data, and it's basically giving people like you the um, access to these data across the nation. So here's a couple of questions just to make sure you are um, wondering if you should stay with me tonight. So the first question is, have you ever lost colonies over the winter? And I know your winter is slightly different than the winter here in the north, but yet. If your answer to this is um, no, <laughs> then this talk is still for you because we want to know what you are doing. We would love to know how, what you're doing. And if you've answered yes, well then this talk is probably for you as well. Um, do you have a monitor for Varroa? And I'm not asking you if you treat for Varroa, I'm asking you if you are monitoring for Varroa. So um, if you answered yes, that's really great. And we would really love to have your data. Um, and if you answered no, this talk is also probably for you because you should, you know, you, you might want to start considering monitoring um, for Varroa. The next question is, uh, do you monitor for Varroa every month? And so that's a, a, a different question because I used to monitor for Varroa, but basically once or twice a year. And I realized with the Sentinel Apiary program that that was probably not enough. And ever since then, I, I feel like I have better results and I know what's going on in my colony because I do monitor every month. So the next question is, do you participate in the Sentinel Apiary program? If your answer is yes, then I, say you can leave, but you probably wouldn't because you probably would like this program and want to talk about anything Sentinel. But if you don't, um, or if you want to know more about the program and what it offers, not just in participating, but in data access, um, you should stay on and we're going to be looking at some of those things. So let's, without further ado, talk about it. The Sentinel APRE program is basically a six-month program where you monitor um, the colony health metrics of four, eight, or 12 colonies. And the cost for, um, for these things are, are like from $325 to $750 uh, for the 12 colony kits. If you are a member of the American Beekeeping Federation, you can also get $100 off your first year. So that's kind of worth it. So I, I get the cost out of the way because a lot of people kind of go, wow. And then and then I explain what the program is about. And you can see that in the end, I usually do a cost benefit analysis. And um, I personally save money by doing the Sentinel Apiary because I don't lose as many colonies and I can actually um, make nukes the following year. I ended up selling nukes. I haven't bought a package in 10 years. And all of this is because Sentinel made me a better beekeeper. I firmly believe that. Um, <clears throat> but you can also follow our data colony uh, um, our, our colony data, and then that can also help you uh, figuring out what's going on in your region specifically. So let's see, you need four to eight colonies. And um, now the beekeepers are actually allowed to uh, share kits. So let's say you want to buy a kit as a club. Um, you could have, if you don't have club hives, if you have club hives, you can do it on the club hives. If you don't have club colonies, then you can have a few of your participants, your, you know, your, your membership split a colony. So a split a, a kit. So you could buy a 12, for example, and then you have three people with four colonies uh, that are doing this every month. I will show you what it does in the end. So every single month from May to October, you would be um, monitoring for all sorts of colony health metrics. The first one is your queen status. So you would indicate if you are a queen right, if you see your queen, you don't have to see her, queen non-seen, you know. So there's, there's a couple of different things that you would write about the queen status. Then you look at the brood pattern and the quality of that brood pattern. So basically how solid it is. So we have a range from one to five. 
Um, we're also asking you for the, the number of frames of bees and that's the colony size that's um, calculated in number of frames of bees. And we show you exactly how to uh, uh, monitor for that, so see how, how to figure it out. So it's like a, a deep frame full of bees. So we look at the top of the box, we look at the bottom of the box, and then we can kind of make calculations to figure out how big the colony is. So those are the main ones. But then after that, um, <clears throat> you get monthly management. So you would also say what you have done to your colonies all the way from the last time you took the data on these colonies the last month. Um, you take mortality info if there is any. I've never had a colony die over the winter during the time that I was doing the, the Sentinel program, but it does happen. And then you have extra tags and you can have an extra colony into the program. And then of course you would take a sample in a bottle, in a saline bottle, and then you send that sample to the lab and the lab will analyze it for Varroa as well as for Nosema loads. And so um, that takes about anywhere between 10 days to 14 days and then you get a nice little report back. So overall, that's what it is. Let me see if I can get this to play. Um, so I talked about it a little bit. I'm gonna let the video play and then we're gonna go step by step and talk about it a little bit more. Let's see if the sound works. The Sentinel Apiary Program is a colony health monitoring program that helps inform apiary management and provides be informed with some of our most valuable data. Beekeepers enrolled in the Sentinel Apiary Program monitor four or eight colonies in one apiary for six months. Participants perform monthly health inspections of each Sentinel colony and record information such as queen status, brood pattern, and frames of bees, as well as any management they may have recently performed. They also take monthly samples of bees from each Sentinel colony, which are processed by our lab at the University of Maryland for Varroa and Nosema. Beekeepers receive a report of their results within two weeks so that they can make timely management decisions. Participating beekeepers say that monitoring Varroa on a monthly basis has opened their eyes to how extremely mite levels fluctuate over the season, and that continuous monitoring of multiple colonies is essential for proper Varroa management. Data collected from Sentinel apiaries is incredibly powerful and allows us to ask new and exciting questions. For example, we save about 10% of all Sentinel samples as a historical record, and recently a PhD student in our lab, Anthony Nierman, has made exciting headway in correlating internal abnormalities in these bees to colony mortality. This could pave the way for a new method of colony sampling to better predict mortality. Another exciting use of Sentinel data has been a recent collaboration with the team from NASA's DEVELOP program to create a tool that shows us NASA Earth satellite data around your Sentinel apiary to allow us to make correlations between the landscape, colony health, and how the effectiveness of management practices varies across space. The Sentinel Apiary Program is a great colony health monitoring tool and provides be informed with data essential to our research. To learn more about the program or to join, please visit our website at beinformed.org slash sentinel. All righty. So this, this was Kelly Kulhanek, which was a, a PhD student of Dennis Van Engelsdorp in the Maryland lab. And she did her entire PhD on the Sentinel data. Uh, and she is now at uh, Washington State University doing some work on uh, indoor storage, but she still has some other projects that are going on with some of the Sentinel data. We also just got recently some demands for doing some, uh, share some of our Sentinel uh, samples to do some genetic work. So there's all sorts of different opportunities when you participate in this program. It's not just about monitoring for Varroa and getting a report, but it's also all of the research that can go with some of these samples that you would be sending in. So if we take that a little bit uh, slower, um, you sign up for this program if you want to, either as a club or as a group of people, and you can split those colonies. Again, it's four, eight, or 12 colony kits. Um, and it's, it's, it's a really good program for a club in particular. I, uh, when I was president of the Holland Area Beekeepers Association um, 
uh, here in town. I used to use my monthly sampling as an opportunity to get into the colonies with club members. Um, we use them as training and field days together. Uh, it, it was a good way to do a, systema a systematic inspection on colonies and then also show them how to monitor for Varroa. We would do a monitoring and then we would also take the samples on top of that and send that to the lab and see that. And then I would use the report every month to start the meeting to say, here is uh, our, our data from that just came back from the Be Informed Partnership. And uh, what do you think that the management practices should be? Um, let's say we have elevated Nosema or we have elevated Varroa. It was a really good conversation starter and a very good way to talk about uh, the local as well as the seasonal management looking at real data to make real time decisions. So that was one way that we really, uh, um, that a lot of clubs are using our, our Sentinel program, but then other people as individuals are also using that. So let's say you decide to participate. Uh, you would sign up online and then uh, the deadline this year, I think was April 27th. So this is something that you might wanna think about for next year. Uh, then BIP will send you your kit, and that kit comes in with everything that you need to do your sampling for the six months of the year. And uh, it includes the sample bottles, it includes a funnel, it includes the quarter scoop, it includes the protocol and all the directions for the different tasks and data that you need to record. And then this year, for the first time, we do not have data sheets anymore, like you see in that top photo. That used to be our data sheets and they used to come in all gooey and we had to transcribe all of this. We now have an app uh, uh, that you can use on your phone or on a tablet or anything you want like that. And then the data gets recorded directly into the app. So um, no more data sheets uh, full of propolis in the field. So <laughs> that, was, that was a big change this year. Um, we also knew this year participants have access to a series of video trainings that we do, um, as well as online forums, and we started a whole webinar series. We meet with Sentinel Apiary participants every month, and we talk about um, the different things that are, you know, part of the program and sometimes seasonal. Um, we'll, we'll have like talks on diseases, we'll do all sorts of different things related to the, 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 the program throughout the year. So that's also pretty exciting. Um, so here is uh, Matt Hepfinger, which is our California tech transfer team uh, field specialist, and he is in his Sentinel colonies. Uh, each month he goes, he is asked to do an inspection on these colonies, either four, eight, or 12, once again. He assesses and records the number of frames of bees first uh, to estimate the colony size. Then he looks at the queen status, whether the queen has been seen, if it's queen white, queenless, et cetera, et cetera. Um, then he assesses the brood pattern quality from one to five, one being poor, five being great. And then once all these observations are made and recorded, he will take his um, sample of bees. And then um, there's two, there's multiple different, there's multiple methods to do the sample of bees. You can shake them in the bucket, you can scoop them directly from the frame, but we always say be careful because sometimes new beekeepers have a hard time finding their queens. And so it's difficult to, um, you don't wanna put that queen in that sample, of course. So <clears throat> um, once you do that, you take two quarter scoops, put them in that little bottle that we provide, and then you package up uh, all of this. You record everything into our nifty app. You package this up into the box and then you send that back to the University of Maryland. And then after this, uh, they will process. And I'm gonna show you what the process normally looks like. So this is one of our grad students doing NOSEMA. It's microscopy by NOSEMA. So we count the number of spores um, on 100 bees that you have sent. And then that was um, in the lab back in 2019. Um, and this is the Varroa shaker that you saw in the video. This is how we shake in order to dislodge Varroa mites from the bees. Um, this is what it looked like in looks like in the lab. This is not what it has been looking like for the last year. In fact, our lab has been operating, <coughs> not sure how, from the back of a garage in our lab manager's garage, right in the back there between the kayaks and the bikes. She has the whole setup in her garage. As for the Nosema, it's at another student lab at home 
um, in, in, in the midst of her plants and everything else. So somehow we got it all done last year. It was not easy, but we did. Then once those things are done from the lab, uh, we send a report to the beekeepers. This is a report that shows you um, uh, nosema counts. And so you can see that uh, the report is pretty nice on many levels. First of all, it provides you with data regarding nosema and varroa later on. But there are also a very detailed record of all the information that you entered in the notes. So if you are a bit negligent of your hive records, like I am, uh, then these are really great. These reports are really great because they are your records right there. I have my records now. I've been a Sentinel user for six years and I have basically reports on all these colonies for every single month from May to October for six years. So it's really kind of uh, cool to see that you can keep records without necessarily putting too much effort into thinking of a record system that works for you. Um, so this is, you can see here, you can see the colony number on the left, that's the first column. Then the sampling date is your, and then your queen status, your brood pattern, your frames of bees. And then you can have any particular observation notes, uh, the recent management that you've done. And then the columns on the right-hand side are for the lab. This is where we will add uh, the number of bees um, that had varroa and uh, the number of varroas that you had for 300 bees, or in this case for 100 bees, because they do it in percentage and then the millions of spores per bees for nosema. Um, <clears throat> we always highlight anything that is above threshold to kind of show the information to the beekeeper quite, uh, it, you know, quickly. Um, this is another part of the report and this is cool because you can see each of these uh, columns represent one of the month. So this is basically from May to October, all of my data for my eight colonies um, from May all the way to October for each month. So you can see that in August, there was a pretty big uptick in mites. And then from there, um, you know, there was probably a treatment put in because you can see that they went back down into September. And then in October, you can see that, you know, it's slowly going back up a little bit. So it's really kind of interesting to see it this way. We also pr um, present a lot of, um, uh-oh. This is not the first time it does this to me. PowerPoint crashes when I give, give these talks. I don't really know why. So give me one second. I will get it back up here. So these um, <clears throat> reports also come in with a lot of graphs. We have the graphical. Uh, I know. Thank you. Um, they have a lot of graphs. So some people are more visual than others. And so we have uh, some, doo -doo 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 -doo. back here, I believe right here. My back. Sorry about this. Okay, we're getting there. There we go. <clears throat> so graphical representation for the visual in you. This one, uh, for example, shows you the average Varroa load throughout the season. Um, that's the red line. And then that compares it to the threshold, which is the blue line. And it also has the national average in the gray blocks. Uh, and the national average comes from the APHIS national survey performed each year in each state um, every year. So we have all of that information. At, um, so we also have graphs that display the varroa loads for each individual colonies. So that's showing you fairly clearly if you have one that's got a really high load, such as colony number seven here, which should probably be taken care of somehow. Um, so it gives us really important conclusions in the scientists uh, project, citizen scientist project. So it contributes to the beekeeping industry in general. So if we look at um, <clears throat> other things, uh, now not necessarily in the report, but if we continue, so not, no more report, but still some data that this program has brought together. 
Um, this graph illustrates the Varroa load per 100B, the percentage of infestation for the Sentinel users in the red bars, and then uh, for the APHIS national participants in the gray bar. So as you can see, uh, Sentinel users are consistently below the national average, which may indicate a variety of things. Maybe people who participate in Sentinel are um, uh, doing more monitoring, and that's the reason why they have a fewer Varroa loads. But it could also indicate the fact that the program is successful in, in, in keeping people monitoring um, and perhaps treating or taking care of their mites uh, each month. So it's, it's, we're pretty proud of this. Um, there's a lot of other things that, that come out of the program, as I mentioned before. Even though we were interested to learn that the Sentinel participants had average lower uh, Varroa loads than the National APHIS survey, um, Kelly Kulinek, which is that PhD student, the one that uh, narrated the video, she also analyzed treatment data that comes with all of this uh, Sentinel user uh, management information that they record each month. And she was a bit disappointed to find out that even after treatments, the mite loads continued to increase uh, just at a slower rate. So on the graph here, you can see that the mite load for each month of the season for colonies that were not treating, treated at that time, that's in the orange line. And then um, it compares to the colonies that were recently treated in green. So this is really kind of interesting because in the last year, this data was put together in, in a way that explained a lot of things. I'm sure it sounds familiar. Basically, in the Sentinel APR program, we say, so why treat, right? Well, why treat? It's to flatten the curve so that it doesn't increase nearly as quickly, even though it still increases. So in the case of the pandemic that we are uh, slowly climbing out of, the reason was to prevent the overflow in the healthcare system. But in the case of Varroa mites, it is to keep the load as low as possible under a threshold to increase the chances for colonies to make it through the winter and prevent huge infestations to other colonies in, uh, in your neighbors, for example. So what about the treatment options, you might ask? Um, <clears throat> Kelly also looked at Varroa growth following different kinds of treatments available on the market. And although a lot more analysis needs to be done on these data sets, preliminary data showed that amitraz-based apivar was the best at slowing down the increase of varroa load, followed by a combination of product uh, like thymol-based product with epigard, um, or followed by the formic acid and oxalic acid. Of course, the results on oxalic acid may be due to the timing that was needed for that type of treatment. We all know it's best to do this in the broodless period. So uh, often late in the fall, which often results in the lack of post-treatment data in this particular treatment. So in, in the program, in the Sentinel Apiary program, you know, it goes to October. So if you do your oxalic acid period in October, like to, or late in October, or even beginning of November, like it is here in Michigan, then none of this data is actually getting into the data set for recording. So that's important to kind of uh, remember that. And um, also Northworthy, uh, the use of Kumafos or Checkmite, for example, um, and hop oil in this case um, was HopGuard 1 and perhaps 2, but I know it was not 3 um, because it only came out last year and these data was, were taken before that as well as fluvalinate and, uh, and other non-chemical treatments did not show any significant difference between the varroa growth of treated compared to non-treated colonies. So we have no significant differences between those products and the varroa loads. Um, it's also important to mention that some varroa populations have shown marked resistance uh, in certain products such as Kumafos and fluvalinate. So that's checkmite um, and um, fluvalinate. You have to know that um, some mites may be resistant to those treatments. So in summary, what if I could just summarize those two last two slides that I just showed you, what we've learned from the Sentinel Apiary data here um, what we want to extract, the pertinent information that we want to extract here, is that treating to keep your varroa mites as low as possible is important, 
Some products such as Amitraz and Thymol may be better than others, but perhaps using a combination of product and rotating them, their use is the best strategy according to data that we have gathered from the Sentinel Apiary program. I'm saying that, what I'm saying here is what we have data to show for. I do realize that there are groups that prefer treatment uh, free options and there are things that can be done mechanically. Uh, there is genetics and lines of bees that are uh, more resistant to Varroa, um, keeps threshold, you know, above uh, below threshold at all times. So I know that there are other things. What I'm just describing here is the data that we've collected in the Sentinel program over the last eight years of this running. Um, next. Uh, doo -doo -doo -doo. All right, so here's what we wanna do. We wanna do a little exercise. Um, on our research uh, portal on the Be Informed Partnership. So if you go to beinformed.org, you will find a place where it says research portal and you can go and spend hours and hours looking through our data, whether it's the data, well, let's, let's go do it right now. Uh, whether it's the data from the colony loss and management survey, um, whether it's the Sentinel apiary locations that we have and all of the Sentinel information. So let's look at the Sentinel. So let's see how many Sentinel participants we have in California. Okay, so I'm gonna click on California. Oh, we have one county represented in California and it seems to be in 2020 anyway. And it seems that that county is represented um, is represented by one person. And that one person has one colony registered in there. So basically we have no Sentinel users in California uh, to speak of, right? This is only one colony. So you could see the average Varroa from that person, the average Nacima. Um, and you would be able to see this all throughout for all of their colonies. So, sorry to say California is not doing too uh, well in representation in Sentinel. So you might really, really want to think about doing this as a club to at least represent your state. Um, but in comparison, let me show you Michigan because of course that's where I'm at and we're gonna be choosing 2019 because Last year was a difficult year. And so we're gonna go here and look at that. We have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine county represented. So I'm gonna go and choose this one because that's those are my colonies. Uh, and that was two years ago. And I had a terrible time with Varroa two years ago. I'm not very proud of these data, but they are there and I'm gonna show you. This was my average Varroa over the course of the summer. You can see here, in September, I had a huge problem. I had a huge problem, but I did do something about it as you can see here in October. Um, and then I ended up with 87% a, a survival. But if I had not been doing Sentinel, I may not have known that I had that big of a problem in September. And the one thing that um, Sentinel has taught me is that um, I used to think that I didn't have a problem until August or September. Well, it started a couple of years ago to show up in my colonies earlier and earlier, like in June and July. And then it made me realize that, you know, populations go really crazy. If I can keep my population lower earlier in the season, I now don't have that spike in the fall. So there's a lot of things that I've learned going through this program to look at data and be able to make decisions from it. The other thing that I wanted to show you is this was my average nosema. So I did have a couple of colonies in, um, in the spring, in the first month, the month of May there, right after our winter, the bees are all coming out, where I had two colonies that had high nosema. And the first year I received that information, I'm like, what do I do with this information? Do I treat, do I not treat? So it threw me into doing research about nosema and treating for nosema or not treating for nosema. So I, for me, that was a lot of um, good learning opportunities throughout the years. 
So this is some of the information that you can go and see uh, on our website. You can also go on our website to look at any of our other data, which I'm gonna show you right now. Um, we have all of the colony loss and management uh, data that's there for all the years. And it's really cool because you can actually uh, search um, for different things. So let's look at the management survey, for example. You could search for California only. So you could take them all out. You could search for California and all years that we ran. And you can see here, these were the average winter loss per type of beekeeper. So the backyard beekeeper lost 37% compared to the commercial that lost maybe 26%. And this is your respondent's ratio. Of course, there's a lot more backyard beekeepers that respond, but in terms of colony, they have a lot fewer colonies than the commercial beekeepers. So they're not, you know, representation wise, it's good. Then if you wanted to, you could go and search on the left-hand side, you have all these different things. So who used the Varroa treatment, for example? There you go. Um, in the backyard beekeepers, I, I'm, that's not backyard, that's all beekeepers, that's sideline. So let's do backyard beekeepers, let's say this is you. Those that did not use Varroa treatment lost colonies for 40% and those that did at 31%. So there were fewer losses for those that use that. Um, <clears throat> You can do this for feeding. You can do this for any management for, uh, um, practices. So you can go and tailor your search and look for the data that we have on this information. We also have colony maps and losses for all of the rest of the US, but we have hive monitorings as well, which are um, hives that are on scale. So you can see like seasonal um, changes on scaled bees, which is kind of cool. The Sentinel Apiary map is what I showed you earlier. Then we have the mic check program that we also run and then a virus map, which might be interested, uh, interesting for you to learn a little bit more. Viruses are really the big thing, right? Varroa itself doesn't kill bees. It's the viruses that they um, <clears throat> transfer that do seem to be killing bees. So why is it that in the old days we had like 10 Varroa threshold and then five, and then it went down to three. And now some people are talking about one. And all of this is because the mites are getting more and more virulent. They are carrying more viruses and it's those viruses that really affect bees. So you can go and check out our virus maps. So I, I'm, I'm done with looking at the, um, at the website, but this was the, the slide to explain that we have tons and tons and tons of data Again, it's, you know, we don't make claims that something work or doesn't work. All we do is that we show the data that we collect. And um, oftentimes we make correlations. We know it's not necessarily causation that it's, uh, <clears throat> and we make sure that we make that clear, but we are presenting what we find. So that's, that's really what we do. Um, <clears throat> If you need more convincing about this program, whether it is to know about things like the, the data that you can go and find or participate in it, here are some of the things that I've learned participating in it. I would like to think that I'm <clears throat> uh, diligent enough to monitor my, varroa, my, my colonies every single month for Varroa, but one thing led, leads to another. It's been two months and I haven't, so there was one year I did not participate in Sentinel. And I realized because my, my, my inspections weren't due, my sam samples weren't due to the lab, because I didn't have that monthly thing that I was participating in, I realized I didn't do my monthly Varroa um, checks. And that was pretty costly to me that year. You know, I kind of let things go. So I need to participate in the program just to make me do regular inspections and perform monitoring on my colonies. But that's just me, it might not be everybody else. Um, I also realized that the real time data is the light that shines really bright on management decisions. I used to, yeah, I used to say, well, if I don't know, I don't know, right? What, whatever you don't know, you don't do anything about it. And I hear a lot of people tell me, oh, I don't have Varroa or I don't see Varroa. If you don't have a very good monitoring program, um, you're not really a beekeeper. You're supposed to be a, a mite manager these days. And so, you know, I have a feeling that without the data, I wouldn't be taking action. I realized after a few years that my Varroas were showing up earlier in the year. And if I did something about it earlier, maybe I wouldn't have the problems that I had in the fall. 
And that was really sentinel that made me realize that seeing these data, seeing these graphs about my own colony, knowing exactly what was going in there. <clears throat> and I know we hear it all the time, but this program made me realize that Varroa is a huge problem and a reality. Um, but it also made me realize that Nosema, not so much. For me as a backyard beekeeper, if I have a high colony that has a high Nosema, I don't do anything about it. And normally the next month it's gone. They have righted the situation. So there are certain things that are not necessarily as problematic, but kind of interesting and nice to know. The threshold may vary from one mic by, you know, uh, in, in the spring, three in the winter, whatever they call it. But what I've realized for me is that I felt like I was wishful thinking. If I had only one mite in June, I was all excited. I'm like, see, I only have one mite. I don't have to do anything about it. But I realized that one mite doesn't stay one mite. That's the problem is that it, it becomes a whole lot more than that. So to me, that was like, it, it, it kind of, the light bulb went off after a couple of years of doing this to make me realize that it never stays that way. Um, <clears throat> The other thing is that I realized that taking care of my bees in real time with real time data uh, makes me made me a better beekeeper because I realized what's going on in my colonies. And it really paid off in the end. I made that that little assessment, which I'm going to spare you. But um, that year, I wanted to know how much the cost of sentinel uh, was compared to the amount of money that I saved in uh, wintering bees and then being able to make splits and sell these splits and not have to buy packages. And uh, in the end, I was very much in the green and I, I made a couple of thousand dollars, you know, in the spring that I would not have made if it wasn't for the Sentinel program. So these were some of the lessons that I learned from the program. Um, here are some testimonials. We, I think that most of the users would say the same thing as I say all the time. Um, it's really, you know, it made them do this and that's through this process that they were able to get to know their bees a little bit better to know the seasonal effect of beekeeping in their localities and um, that they became better beekeepers in the end. So with that, um, <clears throat> I guess I will the time how much time did I take here about 50 minutes that's what I was thinking. Okay, so I always say a big thank you to all of our collaborators because we do a lot of uh, work together. I talked to you about Sentinel. I can talk to you about anything else related to BIP or I can answer any other questions that you have, whether it's related to our data or uh, some of the things that you know we do. Um, I guess I'm open for questions. I'm gonna look at the chat. I should probably get out and stop sharing so we can all see each other's faces. Looks like Nikki had a question. Does the Sentinel program test for viruses? I didn't catch that. Okay, uh, that's a really good question. So I, I really like this question and I'm gonna take it back tomorrow. So currently, no. Um, we do offer virus testing at University of Maryland. So if you wanted to test for a, you know, a couple of colonies or a composite sample or whatever, we could run a virus uh, sample on, on a virus test on your bees if you asked for it. Um, we are discussing changing this Nosema thing, which I feel like doing Nosema every single month for six months with information that I don't think the beekeepers really get as much out of. What I would like to do is I would like to change that so that we have like two nosemas, probably like one in May and one in October or something like that. Cause I think that those are the best times to test for nosema and have that information. And then test for viruses instead. So do uh, one or two virus samples uh, like in August or September which is where usually the number of mites are higher and the viruses get passed on. So that is something that you've heard it here first, folks, because we haven't announced this at all, but this is something I'd like to look at in the future is to replace some of the Nosema with at least one or two viral um, sampling. So we don't currently do it, we can do it, um, and we're hoping to do it. So I guess that's a question. I have a question about the viral load testing that you're planning. Um, these many of the tests just detect presence or absence. 
you know. A, vir a viral load, you mean? Yeah. So uh, <clears throat> would you be actually quantitating it? Yeah. So um, here's the deal. Uh, we do what we call viral loads. It's a PCR molecular test. So we detect how many of these, you know, bits and pieces of genetics that are um, from each of those viruses. And so we do do a load. Unfortunately, <clears throat> because we don't know a lot on viruses, we're doing a lot of research on viruses, but because we don't know that much on viruses, we have a load, but we can't really tell you. We can tell you percentile wise, this is in the 70th percentile. This is in the 90th percentile from all of the different samples that we've analyzed over the years. But we don't have very good thresholds when it comes to viruses. Those have not really been identified yet. So we do have presence and load, but the loads are a little arbitrary, if that answers your question. A uh, couple more quickie. So presumably you will crush up like a, a, a bunch of bees to get an average across the bees that are sampled. You mean for a viral again? Yeah, yeah. yeah. And you probably yeah. do that for Nosema too, right? Right, right, right. So uh, Nosema is 100 bees. Um, uh, viral is 50 bees. Mm -hmm. So again, it's super variable, right? If you pick up 50 bees from right under the cover or you pick up 50 nurse bees, you won't have the same viral loads, right? And yeah. so... Um, there's also a lot of variation in some of the sampling. So we try to always standardize what kind of samples we take when it comes to viruses. Uh, and when it comes to Nosema and Varroa, same thing. So we really tried to take like a frame that has both cap brood and uncapped brood and have nurse bees, um, uh, the younger bees, because we know that bees sometimes will carry more Nosema, carry more of the viruses, et cetera, et cetera. So we try to standardize the collection of the sample. But there is variability there too. I, uh, I got a, yet another viral question. Um, <laughs> yeah, there's, there's a lot. These different, there's, there's these lot. different DWV variants. <laughs> Apparently, some are more uh, pathogenic than others. Yeah. Are you going to be able to distinguish between those? Yep. Yep. Absolutely. So Ooh. we have the form wing virus A and the form wing virus B, and now there are new variants coming up too. And um, we just wrote a grant actually to do some of that work. Uh, in, in, we're, you know, everybody's, ex everybody, it's time to do viral work and to do variant work just because, you know, all of the buzzwords from the pandemic are there. And so a lot of the researchers here, yeah, yeah, we'll fund that. Um, so we are looking right now at uh, seeing if there is in higher density um, areas, if there are more recombinations happening, if there are more variants uh, showing up. And if those variants are indeed more virulent, right? So we do know that uh, between the form wing virus A and the form wing virus B, there are some variants, uh, and those variants are more virulent. They seem to be uh, killing bees a little faster. So we want to test that and look to see if in high density area. So we were just joking around this week, saying everybody wants to go to the, uh, you know, to the concert. And so is it is it at the concert that we're gonna catch COVID or we're going to catch the form wing virus, right? And so, so it's, it's, yeah. And so what do you do uh, with that information? Our field specialist was like, well, what do we tell our beekeepers? You know, how does this um, information relate back to the beekeeper? And we said, well, we could have them wear a mask. So wear, for example, robbing screens, perhaps, um, you know, or perhaps make some distance you know, so it was really interesting because they're all all these parallels with the pandemic and, you know, with our own um, behaviors in the last year. So uh, you're absolutely right. There are some in this, the form wing virus is one of them. And it's one of the most virulent is those variants between the form wing virus A and B. Thank you. There was another question from Tom that says, are there any regional average, regional average for Varroa loads or for Nosema loads? Yeah, um, in a number of your plots, you showed your Varroa counts for your samples. And then there was a line for the national average. But I was, that kind of provoked me to think, what about here where our climate is drastically different than the nation as a whole? And so it would be interesting to see those numbers. But then you kind of showed that data as the presentation proceeded. Right. There is also the fact that, um, so APHIS national data 
uh, APHIS is taken in all the different states. So APHIS is also a regional and a statewide thing. So you would uh, be able to dig, or dig deeper into the APHIS uh, regional and state data if you wanted to, which th some of those data are available also on our website and I believe on the USDA's website as well. But you know, that gives me an idea. It would be pretty interesting to not only have the national average as the gray blocks, but maybe you have darker gray blocks that are the state average, for example, which we have that for APHIS. That's an interesting thought. Anything else? No other questions? Is there still time to participate this year? Get that May data? Yeah, so they, they closed it up this year on April 27th, I think, because they needed to get those kits out. Um, if your club was interested, um, I can definitely ask to see if we can get a kit out to you. Um, they, closed, they closed down the registration for this year, but we can mm. always ask, right? All that. All that can happen is they can say no. Thanks. So our bees raise brood all winter long, and it seems like the six month uh, window for your uh, monitoring program um, matches up with the temperate climate beekeepers who uh, shut their bees in in the fall and, and break them out in the spring. Um, could you or has it ever been considered to uh, do some uh, maybe random sampling in um, Mediterranean and warmer climates to see whether a program could be extended in, in terms of, of months of the year um, for those beekeepers who do have bees raising brood all winter long. Right, that's a good question. We've had that same question in Georgia, for example, and Florida. Um, however, other beekeepers have said that you know, even though they raise brood, it's not necessarily the main active season. And that because they raise brood, they don't have like that typical, you know, increase in population. And it's that increase in population that's important when it comes to varroa loads. And so I think that that was the reason for not extending the season. Um, but there might be some interesting data to come in, like, so for example, I was talking about the oxalic acid earlier. We don't have any good data on oxalic acid related to Sentinel because most people who use oxalic acid will use it like at the tail end of the season. And therefore we don't have that next data to show where it has gone. So some of these might be good reasons to extend um, but then we would have to extend in multiple regions so that we have enough data to actually make a comparison. So extending just in California or just in, in Georgia would not give us really the epidemiological perspective that we're looking for. Um, but if we were to able to do it all throughout the South, perhaps. Any other questions? I like this this group to be quiet. <laughs> <laughs> That's interesting. Well, either it's too early for you. I was gonna say, well, it's late, but actually it's probably too early for you. You're digesting. You're just like after dinner, right? That after dinner. I hated that when they gave me the after lunch section, right? <laughs> Everybody is sleeping. Um, but I don't know. I just I wonder why it is that there's no Sentinel participant in California. Is it because we haven't reached out to, uh, have you ever heard? I guess I would like to know. Okay, here's this. Let's take a poll. Who has heard of this program before? Anyone? Okay, Mike had heard about it. So somebody's heard about it somewhere. So I'm just wondering why we have no Sentinel, although you've seen that there are some states that we don't have a lot of participants. I've been keeping bees for 10 years and I was not aware of this program. See, yeah. And we, 
we often relate to, so in California, we have a big presence in California, the Informed Partnership has a big presence in California, but it's mainly with commercial beekeepers. I don't think that we uh, target California as a backyard or sideline or um, state. That's probably a, a something that we need to remedy. Of roughly 400 beekeepers in this club, um, mm -hmm. there's one commercial beekeeper, namely Jim, and uh, a few that might be considered sideliners. Uh, but the vast majority of uh, our members are backyard beekeepers, urban beekeepers, suburban beekeepers. Mm -hmm. One or two, three, four hives, usually fewer than 10. Now that's a, that, that's definitely, that sh to me that indicates that we need to reach out to the clubs a little bit more. Um, I think f for that audience anyway. So that's something I learned tonight, thank you. <laughs> it is interesting that you also don't have a lot of commercial though, that because there's a lot of commercial and um, have, have you did a, a talk like at the Delta B Club, which is primarily commercial? Yes. So um, we have two field specialists in California. Rob Snyder has been with Bee Informed Partnership and worked with commercial beekeepers in California for years now. He mostly works with the queen breeders in the northern uh, region and doesn't have as much um, reach down further south, although you guys are not south, but um, um, you know, we end up in California all throughout February and March. All of our field specialists from all over the country are all in California at that time. We don't, I don't think that we service on a regular basis, the more um, Southern California commercial beekeepers. But when it comes to the rest, um, I know Rob Snyder has done the rounds many times, Mike Andre, all these guys have done the rounds uh, uh, talking to the commercial guys, which of course, you know, it's interesting to see a commercial guy on a, on a, a more of a backyard group because they're very rare and they're often, it, it's, it's many states are very separated in that, in that sense. So it's really nice of you to be here and give that perspective. Yeah, I, I was also the president of Delta and, you know, Delta you might be able to get a pretty good, uh, you know, Central Valley type of, um, you know, visibility. Um, I don't, you know, I, was, I, I go to that one as well, and I don't recall you guys speaking there. Okay. But I, I may have missed it. But, um, Mike, you, you, you used to go there a lot. Do you remember it from Delta? I, I don't, but I, uh, Dennis gave a talk at the State Beekeeping Convention a number of years back and brought it up then, so that's how I heard about it. Right. I so I think that for, <clears throat> for a little while, we had some issues because we were overloaded with the queen breeders in the north and we just didn't have the mind power to go into the south or central valley uh, very much. But then I think that after that, we tried to reach out a little bit more with some of our field specialists and then we might not have had the response at the time or we may have burned bridges. I don't know, there's something going on and I'm not quite sure what it is. I'm trying to figure that out. Um, Rob is still working. We have a new field specialist that's doing in California and he's doing a lot of more aphases throughout the southern part. Um, so we should talk, Jim. We should definitely talk and uh, we should reach out to Delta and do something there, definitely. That'd be great. Yeah, yeah, actually, the, the next Delta meeting is in the, on the 1st of June. So uh, I, I can bring it up there as well. That'd be great. I'd love that. And then we can get in contact and get Rob involved and Matt involved. Matt's a pretty good speaker, so it's great. Yeah, even that group is changing too. Uh, there's a lot of, a lot more backyard, um, you know, or hobbyists there as well. But it's really nice that you guys are getting together. So like in Michigan here, we're completely separate. The, the, the commercial guys don't even like talk about the date that they're meeting because they wanna make sure it's only by invitation. It's like, it's crazy. But on the other hand, the state over with Wisconsin, I end up going to Wisconsin all the time. And over there, it's the opposite. The commercial and the backyard beekeepers work together. Their association are together. Their meeting is are together. And it's really, really cool to go there and they learn from one another and it, it works. It really does. And I think it's really great. So I'm, I'm so glad to hear you say that California is heading that way too. We've got to talk, We're, you know, we all care for that same 
insect which should be able to talk. So I think that's really great. My, you're running several hundred fives or a couple hundred fives, right? What's that? You're running a couple hundred fives as well, right? A little less. I can't imagine running 200. <laughs> Um, and then, you know, I know Catherine has got a bunch and, you know, there's, there's several, several people here that have a good number of hives. That's great. Yeah, you seem to be a really uh, involved group. I, as I said, I know somebody from your group, but um, I don't think she's here tonight. I traveled with her a few years back. We went on a beekeeping tour of Slovenia together. So um, I was, who, who was it? Carmelita Palma. She's part of your group, I think. Uh, I think she's a member like here and in, in uh, the Mount Diablo Club. Yeah. Okay. Well, she she said that she had she sent me a text to say that she had seen that my program was going to be up. She's oh, I'm excited that you're coming to our club. So uh, I, I it was really kind of interesting how you know people and you're related by bees. You know, we traveled together. What was it? Four years ago, I think. Um, uh, we found ourselves on that same tour, and so it's uh, it's such a small. It's such a small world, even though there's so many of us, you know, it's just really great that we, we can get together and talk about all these um, fantastic topics. I, we, we give a lot of different talks at BIP. We also have like all sorts of other stuff that's related to diseases because that's what we do best. <laughs> that's our specialty. It's not necessarily the most fun thing topic to talk about, but uh, we talk a lot about those things too. So, because we have a lot of data on it too, so mostly with the commercial beekeepers, so. Yeah. <laughs> do you, what's the, uh, uh, the feed, do you get much feedback on uh, people who have cases of American fowl brood around the country? Is there any particular um, indication of whether it's declining or advancing or area uh, where it's more prevalent? Or is your sampling too thin? Well, we, our commercial sampling, I mean, we, we we uh, sample in 17 states, 10 of the most produce, uh, honey producing states. And so we have tons of data and our field specialists have their you know, hands and eyes and colonies all day long, every day of the year. So, and they have a really bird's eye view of all of this stuff. So um, I can tell you, we don't see it very often. We really don't. It's, it's, it's not very prevalent at all. Um, you know, a couple of cases here and there, oftentimes isolated. We tell the beekeepers and they, some states it's reportable, some states it's not. So um, because we work for the beekeepers, we're contracted by the beekeepers. We tell the beekeeper and it's up to them to tell the states if it is a reportable um, disease in their state. So <clears throat> we're not let you, we're not uh, regulatory at all. We're, so we, you know, but I can tell you, we don't see it very often. It's, I don't know if it's the type of beekeepers that we work with or, or what, it's not prevalent. EFB on the other hand, some, some years are like pretty prevalent. Um, um, was it last year or two years ago when we had like a really, really wet spring in, in almonds? Oof. We had EFB galore all year and some colonies just never recuperated. And so we see a lot more EFB. Have, have you noticed any change in how things are are, are going with you now that they have to get uh, prescriptions basically for antibiotics? Has that changed anything from your from your data? Um, <clears throat> for the hobby beekeepers, it changes a lot. <laughs> um, on the other hand, most hobby beekeepers don't necessarily see these things, or they don't necessarily know how to recognize them, or when they do, it's very difficult to have access to. You know. I have to tell you the story. I found EFB in my colonies here. This spring we had a little out, earlier outbreak of EFB in, in colonies than I've seen it in Michigan before. Normally we see it after blueberries here, um, but it actually hit like end of April, beginning of, it was just coming out of the winter. It was really weird. I think it was cold and whatever, lots of things. And you would think I'm pretty connected. <laughs> you know, I, I actually teach the vets at uh, MSU on, you know, how to recognize bee diseases. And so you would think I'm connected. Um, I couldn't get a prescription to get, <laughs> to get anything. It was really ridiculous. 
And I was trying to go the right way. I was trying not to call on my beekeepers, which, you know, the commercial guys, they stockpiled all this stuff. And I don't know that they have run out yet. So it hasn't changed much for the commercial guys yet. They either have a connection with the vet already or they've stockpiled and they haven't needed it yet. Uh, but I can tell you that for the backyard beekeepers, if they ever need something, like normally that's not something I would treat because here we have it after blueberries and we have a huge flow right after that and a good flow will clear it up if it's not too bad. So normally I wouldn't do anything. But this year it was really early on and my colonies were struggling to just try to build and I didn't want to infect everybody in the neighborhood. So I decided I was gonna do that and I couldn't find anything. I mean, it took me literally a week to, 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 to get uh, a prescription. So I, I would say that it hasn't changed yet too, too much in, um, in the sense that there's still some stockpile. Um, it was the same thing for Nosema and, and that humagillin for a little while too. Yeah. Uh, but so that, that's my observations. Those are my thoughts. I don't have any data on that. But for now, I haven't seen it except for my own frustrations two weeks ago trying to get something for it. So I'm just, I'm just curious because it's been, this is the second year, right? Right, right. So I just wondered if the data would start showing through your, through your survey. I, um, so in my survey, we don't report. And the thing is for us, so the survey is, is beekeeper reported, right? Um, and so we have to be very careful because things like uh, we report perception from the beekeeper. And so I cannot, you know, I, it's like I cannot ask so-and-so to tell me if they had, um, you know, something that needs to be diagnosed by either a vet or a professional. So if my field specialists tell me that they see EFB or AFB, I, I know that they do. Um, but if a, a beekeeper tells me that they see something, you know, who knows? They call me all the time because they think they have American cloudbrew, but I've, I've never found that. I've never found it in colonies that the beekeeper has called me to say that they thought they had it. So, you know, you read about all these things and then, you know, it's a little bit the, the prophecy. You go into your colonies and you see all these things, but it's not necessarily there. So, um, so we haven't seen that yet. I think that viruses are a huge deal. And, and um, I don't know if it was another, the other Jim, his camera's turned off now. I just see Jim. Yeah, so, yeah. so, you know, Jim's asking some really good questions because I think that viruses is really where we need to look into more because we don't have enough data. We don't really understand how they work. We don't really understand their threshold. There's so much stuff that we don't know about viruses. And right now, I feel like that's the number one killer of bees. So, you know, we blame Varroa, we treat for Varroa, but really it's those viruses that are doing it. Like you saw some of the numbers that I showed you about my colonies. I had like 30 some mites. I had like 30% 30% infestation and some of these colonies made it through the winter. And they made it because most likely I didn't have a lot of viruses. I don't have any data to show that. So now I'm taking viral data to make sure that I can show that. Um, but I really do think that there's a lot to viruses and that's, that's a very understudied area. So we're trying to get more data on that, um, but it's where it's at. I think AFB is not really, like I'm not worried about a AFB. Um, I'm a little worried about EFB and those outbreaks and some of those years that are difficult, but it usually clears out, it's not too, too bad. Um, all of these other ones like sac brew virus, chalk root is annoying as heck and it's really hard to get rid of when you have it or if you have these couple of colonies every year. Some, some operations historically has it and there's not much you can do about it, but it's not like viruses where I feel like viruses are everywhere and they're the ones killing our bees right now. But I don't know, those are my two cents <laughs> worth. No, I agree. I agree. You agree? Do you agree? Good. Yeah. And I, th I think that we're, we're just, we need, to, we need to learn a whole lot more. We need to learn about their transmission. We need to learn about their threshold. We need to learn like, so all of the viral samples that we run, they all have black queen cell virus. What does that mean? Every single, every single viral analysis that we run has black queen cell virus. And in the last Bee Culture magazine, I read that a group in Europe thinks that the 
black queen cell virus is related to nosema infection, which I, I, I think maybe maybe it's just incorporated in their genome. <laughs> right, exactly. So so there's all this stuff that I'm just you know a little confused about. So yeah, viruses I think is a place where we really really need to learn more about. That's the that's the next. Uh, and with you know with all this 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 uh, technology out there, all this next gen, it should be possible to do. Yeah. What about in, in your region? Do you have a lot of so in in, in large swaths of of California, there's huge dearth um, periods, and you know somebody was joking around with me last because I had a, a really bad yard this spring and it was cold, and I said. I gotta feed my bees in the spring. What is this feeding bees in the spring? And somebody said, you need to treat them like they're California bees. <laughs> so I guess that's not that bad in, in all the area, but do you have like a pretty big dearth periods of time where you have to feed your bees constantly? I can, well, if you're asking me, I, I have apiaries that have, that are in fields and they're, uh, you know, starting about now, this year starting now, normally it'd be like in mid June to July, but yeah, I'm already starting, you know, noticing their, you know, the flow's done, pollen's, pollen's not there. So yeah, I'm already starting to get, go into a dearth mode, which is probably a month earlier than normal. For me, normally my, my worst month is, uh, you know, the end of July and August. Most of the people here though are in cities. So the cities don't, you know, the cities have irrigated, wow. irrigated flowers and, you know, a lot of, um, a lot of, a lot of it for them to, to feed on. But, Ornamentals. Uh, yeah. yeah. Our, yeah. There's, there's a lot of diversity. I mean, the, in the inner Bay area, the big flow is over already. Um, and, but, but there's probably no need to feed if you're in the suburban areas. Okay. Yeah, that makes sense. It's very different than, but one thing you mentioned was, uh, you know, in California, we have um, a high risk of wildfires and actually not even such wildfires or ur urban fires too. Um, and I'm just kind of curious about how the smoke has affected the health of the bees in the last year. It's been pretty terrible um, because even if it's, you know, a hundred miles away, the smoke carries. And, um, you know, if there was one day last summer, I guess it was, or fall, where we had like a total blackout of the of the Bay Area and the bees didn't fly because it looked like it was night to them. So Leslie, that's a really good point. So the field specialist I was talking about in California, his name is Rob Snyder. He, he's been talking about the smoke and the effect of the smoke on the bees for two years now. And um, he has seen that uh, colonies uh, do not have a chance to go out and forage as much and therefore have very, very low stores and they are unable to maintain big populations to go into the winter. He feels that the smoke in California has been very detrimental um, to colony health. And so we don't talk about that necessarily in a lot of parts of the country, but he feels that that is very much affecting them. So I'm reporting his words here, I would much prefer mm -hmm. It, but um, definitely well, to do the, the uh, daily tracking of the air quality index was a thing with people in everyday life, whereas before, like nobody really, we didn't necessarily pay attention to that because right. it wasn't needed. But now, yeah, people were wondering, like, should we go outside? Yeah, absolutely. And that was the same thing. That's what he was saying, that they weren't able to forage. Um, they weren't able to put enough stores. And so, you know, there's so much you can feed bees, right? It's just like... You, Oftentimes, you know, feeding and feeding and feeding is one thing, but uh, yeah, he did feel like it did affect a lot of bees. Uh, mainly, was it last year that was the worst or the year before? I think it was last, last year, year was before. really bad. Mm -hmm. right, right. He was he was feeling that in the fall, there was a lot of bees that were not even going to go into the winter because they didn't have an, a chance to build enough stores. Somebody wrote a question about if there is any data on amitraz in uh, residues in honey and how bad it is. Um, I can't really answer that question. I know that the USDA was looking at uh, trying to get a little more information on that. There are a couple of studies out there. I don't think there's anything like super conclusive at this point. <clears throat> um, and I think that amitraz, and, and, and I'm gonna, 
I sh probably shouldn't go into this, but um, <clears throat> I think that there's a lot of am a buzz around Amitraz. So I've been privy to some conversations with the Apiary Inspectors of America, with the USDA, and everybody is really worried about Amitraz resistance. Um, as we know, Amitraz is, you know, the number one compound used by the commercial industry in order to uh, control Varroa. And so uh, there's a huge, um, huge concern about Amitraz resistance, potentially on the horizon, number one. And then number two, the second one that some people talk about is the Amitraz residue in honey. But there is currently no uh, good um, conclusive study on that. And I do know that the USDA is working on it. So, um, but there's a lot of buzz around Amitraz. And last year I was, I was, I was thinking that um, something was gonna happen in the industry. And, and I think that there, but the problem is there's nothing else right now that really works. So, um, so we're kind of caught between a rock and a hard place. You know, we can't let all these bees die. Um, but on the other hand, you know, how can we, so there is definitely an um, opportunity for novel tools and they just haven't come out. So there, there's, I, I know that the USDA is also testing a bunch of new compounds, um, trying to kind of add tools to the, the toolbox to uh, in the fight against Varroa. So I don't have a good answer for that, but I can tell you that there, there is some work being done on that. And I can add that, uh, I think it was 2018, again at the state convention state beekeeping convention and and jim i can't remember his first name but uh who it's barkman's honey who's the yeah. name barkman's honey? Is bill barkman isn't it bill is it bill mm -hmm. uh, and his bill. luncheon speak you know he was the the uh featured speaker at the luncheon and they test because he's one of the bigger honey packers out there in the in the country and they test uh the honey that they buy and his comment was to all the commercial guys, well, to everybody in the room, that uh, they're beginning, they were starting to have to reject lots of honey they were purchasing because the Amitraz uh, values in it were uh, too high. Yeah, that and the antibiotics. He, he made a big, uh, big yeah. point about antibiotics as well. Showing right. That, that I knew about the antibiotics, but I did not, uh, I, I haven't seen, like, I, I I guess I'll, maybe I, I can reach out and ask him because at one point they, they didn't really want to test or they were testing one out of every 10 samples because they don't know what they're going to do. You know, the, right. that it's being used everywhere and, you know, it's either that or we have honey that comes from other countries instead. And, you know, it's just there again, harking a hard, hard, a rock and a hard place, right? So what are we going to do? Um, that's a real concern. I think that there's, there's a lot of concern, but we need to come up with some new tools. That's part of the issue here. And I, and the commercial guys are very, very open to that. They want new stuff, but there's just nothing really that works right now. So Jim, what do you use? Um, well, unofficially. <laughs> uh, oh, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to put you on the spot. That was terrible. Yeah, but apple, bar is, apple bar is a tool that I use. Okay. You know, I, I do like apple bar. Um, you know, there's not a lot of time here where, it's, where it's, we can really use it. Right. So for, so for me, it's, you know, Amitraz works best when I'm in almonds because I don't use that honey anyways. It all gets dumped. So, um, so that's about the only time. Every time else around here, you know, maybe in the in August, but even here, I, you know, anything I have around cities can still be bringing in a flow. So, you know, about the only time Amitraz for me works is like, you know, at, you know, the beginning of the year, you know, like in right. Right. January. February. That's another, that's another reason for the Epivar compared to, you know, just Amitraz in general, that you can do a flash treatment rather than a six weeks treatment. And six weeks is a long time. That means you can't put a honey super on those colonies for six weeks. Yeah. And it, it, and it is nice to be able to have some protection in almonds as well. So it's... Right, right, right. Do you rotate anything else? Yeah, well? like... I, I like formic acid, you know, uh, oxalic acid, although it's not legal in California. Oh yeah, that's true, it's not, that's yeah. true. That's true, I forgot about that. 
Yeah. And you don't have any problems with queens with formic acid? I also raise queens though. So, but you, you don't have any queen issues? No, well, I mean, you, you always lose some, you lose some, but I, I raise queens, so I don't, it's not, it's not devastating. I just right. I got it. Some, some people actually use it as, uh, <laughs> as a way to get old queen killers. <laughs> yeah. easier, than, easier than trying to find them, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> I guess so. I guess so. So Weed what out is, the weak ones. <laughs> right. So what's what's the philosophy in, in your club? Because I know that I talk to some clubs and when I talk about monitoring, that's one thing. But when I talk, start talking about treating, that's another. Um, what's the philosophy in your club? Do you guys, uh, uh, you know? We really have both. I mean, we have people that do not treat and uh, we, have, um, we, we have a lot that do treat. So we you know we do both. And, you know, we've been trying to have programs that cover both, uh, you know, both philosophies. Um, but yeah, we have, we have both. I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a firm believer in testing, you know, test often. That's the majority of my, uh, my inspection now is a test. Right. And I, I think that, that that's, that's, that's what makes a difference for me. I mean, I, when I first started beekeeping, I didn't know much about it and I, didn't want to be using chemicals and I didn't want to treat them. But you know, when you do Sentinel and you see those numbers go up and then you see that they don't come out of the winter, you start kind of seeing the light. And um, for me anyway, it was most mostly about seeing the numbers, about monitoring and knowing what was in there. And then from there, you can at least make an informed decision. Um, you know, instead of just saying, well, I don't want to know because I won't treat anyway, then you know, that's kind of like. I feel like that's that's not knowing what's going on in your colonies. If you know what's going on and you decide not to treat, I feel like that that's a decision that you made on facts. So for me, that's that's the reason why this program. When I when I talk about the program and I talk about my uh, experience in it, it was all about monitoring and knowing what was going on in my colonies and you know being able to figure this out. You know, I, the other thing that I, I and we're gonna write an article I think in the Bee Culture. Um, I think that one thing that's really important is not just monitoring, monitoring is great, but also recognizing the signs of varroa damage. And I think that signs of varroa damage for beginning beekeepers or even a couple of years into beekeeping, that is not necessarily easy. Um, you know, you were talking about AFB or EFB, you were talking about identifying those things earlier. How about identifying, you know, uh, what we call PMS, you know, parasitic mite syndrome. Um, you might do a monitoring and find like one or two mites per 100 uh, and think you're all set. But if you recognize the signs of mite damage, uh, you might see that you had higher mites at some point that did do some damage to your colonies, did do some damage to your brood. And I think that that is one thing that's really, really important that we could, I think that we, I think that the, the message of monitoring and that Varroa is a problem has gone through. Uh, we do see uh, changes in uh, over the last few years of the, the, um, the national uh, survey that we run, we do see behavior change. People didn't used to monitor, now people monitor. People used to use a sugar, you know, powdered sugar roll, now they use more alcohol wash. We are seeing every year an increase in monitoring and an increase in using alcohol wash. So we see the behavior changing we do see that they treat more for mites than they used to as well. So that's great. We see these behavior changes. Um, I think that that message has gone through. I think that the next message we need to send out there is how do we recognize uh, mite damage? So, um, you know, that, that whole slew of, of, of clues that you can find in your brood's nest to know that you might have mites. Some people wait to see them on the thorax, right? Um, and one thing that I didn't know before I started working at BIP is that, you know, if they are on adult bees, they're not on the thorax, they're in the sclerites of the abdomen. So you actually have to pick up bees and look at them, their underbelly to see mites. Um, so if you wait to see them on thorax, that's way too late. So oftentimes I'm, I'll, I'll be doing my inspection and I'm picking up bees and looking under their belly. And somebody was saying, what are you doing? I'm like, I'm looking under their bellies. Um, and then I'm also looking at, you know, little holes in my, in my brood, um, 
in my cappings, in my brood pattern. I'm, I'm looking at melted larvae. I'm looking at all sorts of different things that are signs of mite damage, not necessarily mites. So I think that that's something that we can definitely teach our new beekeepers how to look for. My, just, and again, this was my opinion, so you know, definitely not scientific, but it also seems to me that you know, if you have high mite loads even earlier in the year, that when the, the bees start getting under stress, that's when you're going to see the damage. That's when you're going to see the dead hives. Absolutely. Out here, my, you know, the, the bad month that, you know, traditionally for us, it's a bad month has been, uh, at least for me, I'm not speaking for everyone else, has uh, been October. And that's when, you know, the, the weather's changing. They're, they're inside. There's a major change in, in, in their behavior at that point. And the stress, the, the stresses are much higher than in, you know, you know, in the spring where they, you know, it's hard to kill them in. But um, yeah, it seems to me if you have a high mite load any any time of the year, that right. is, that the virus is actually taking hold and actually doing damage in the, in the October timeframe of the year. Right, and I, I think that that's all. You know, it's all related to the varroa mite population dynamics, right? So varroa reproduces inside the the B cells inside the cap under the cap. And so during the summertime, when you have lots of brood, where are all most of the mites? The mites are usually under the cap. When you get to that fall period in October, where the queen starts to shut down a little bit, and then that brood now hatches, there's a lot less brood. So where are the majority of the mites? Now they're on adult bees. So that's why we see a whole lot more in October. Um, but it doesn't mean that it's not there in June, for example. But it's when it's out there or it's been there for months that you start seeing some of this damage on the brood, on the adult population, on the, you know, on the young population, on all over. So now you have all the stressors that come in. Um, and as you say, you know, those, those viruses get pushed around. And so that's really kind of interesting to me to see like that, that um, <clears throat> uh, progression, if you want, of the infestation, which is there all along, but you don't see all this damage and all those mites until later on when there's less brood and then there's more adult bees. And I kind of use that as a, and again, this is my opinion. So, you know, there's, well, it's 25 people on here. So there's probably another hundred opinions. Uh, but, uh, you know, I, I definitely believe that, you know, if you, it's a good reason to keep the mite loads always under control, not just, not just periodically. If you don't test, you don't know. So you have to keep them under control all the time. Right. And that one mite in June, when there's tons and tons and tons of, of brood, you know very well that it's a lot more than that. It's just that, you know, it's hidden. It's that hidden problem it comes out in the fall very easily. Well, I find interesting, sometimes I'll go into a colony and I see all this mite damage or, or what I think is mite damage. And then I, I do an alcohol wash and I have zero mites. And I'm like, hmm, what happened here? So then I start talking to the beekeeper and the beekeeper says, oh yeah, I treated last week. Okay, so now I know. There's no mites in that colony because he treated last week. However, there was really high mite before he treated so much that it had mite damage. And even if he treated, he probably treated too late. So it's really kind of interesting to be able to see all this, not just the mites, but to be able to see the damage that they cause. And of course, as we were talking with Jim earlier, you know, we don't necessarily see the signs of viruses. You see the form wing virus once in a while here and there. You'll see, you know, maybe some trembling bees here and there, shiny bees perhaps. But those are not definitive, except for the, the deformed wings, you know, they're not really definitive until you have a viral analysis. So it's tough to see. I live in an area where there are probably a fair number of feral bee colonies and not that many beekeepers. And the phenomena that I have seen at least a few years ago was uh, you'll have a great strong colony that did wonderfully during the spring flow and is strong during the summer. And maybe in August, maybe in September, maybe October, it starts robbing. When it robs, it brings back a lot of hitchhiker varroa. I know that uh, Randy Oliver has a place for uh, drifting bees uh, bringing varroa in his uh, spreadsheet models, but it's not like the kind of uh, effect that you can get from a colony robbing out another colony that's heavily infested with bees. And I have seen 
uh, in just a week or two, the, the number of mites uh, on a colony go from um, a few, you know, percent or 2% to 10 or 20% uh, on account of uh, the hitchhikers. And then five or six weeks later, the colony, uh, you know, flops because of PMS. Um, so it's something that uh, the normal monthly or even bi-weekly sampling for Varroa might not necessarily catch. If your timing is bad, you're just not going to see it happen. And I suspect that uh, slamming a colony with a treatment, um, you know, uh, hitting it with um, Midaway or some other uh, aggressive treatment might actually stop the colony from robbing, but it might not. So I wonder if some of those so-called failures of uh, mite treatments are actually cases where the colony just continued robbing and continued bringing more hitchhiker mites into the colony. Right, or reinfestations or other colonies in the area, mite bombing or, yeah, absolutely. We had this- I'm not a believer in mite bombing actually because I, I have seen very little drifting. I've had a colony uh, that was robbing go, you know, total PMS and the colonies right next to it continued to have low mite numbers. Repeat that. I have had a colony that uh, went, was overwhelmed by Varroa and went PMS, and just had enormous numbers of mites in it, but the colonies on the adjacent hive stands did not suffer the same kind of spike. So okay. I don't believe in, in, in mite bombing. But you believe in this robbing and hitchhiker bees, oh, right? Oh, absolutely. Okay, so it's a similar I guess the mite bomb can be either the one that dies from the PMS that you're saying that that did not happen, or it can be the ones that have mites that get robbed, right? So the mite bomb may, may not necessarily be the one that dies or that has the most, the most mites. Well, the, the mite infested colonies were somewhere else in you know, their foraging range. Right. Uh, the bees discovered it. It was weak. It couldn't defend itself. It had lots of stores and lots of mites and the robbers right. brought them back because right. it was a strong colony. It could defend itself well uh, right. and it, it was that's, hungry. That's part of my definition of a mite bomb. So it, you know, for whatever reason, they got robbed and then that colony that robbed them ended up bringing those mites back. So to me, that's one of the definition of mite bombing. So, but I do understand what you're saying that it doesn't necessarily um, in the strict sense, doesn't necessarily always happen. Um, but I do. Yeah, find my that understanding was that the, when you get a mite bomb, it's because your colony was exploding with uh, with Varroa, and that's just not my observation in my yard. Yeah. My understanding, my understanding of mite bomb, and maybe I'm maybe I'm misunderstanding, it, is that your colony is out robbing a, a high Varroa colony. That's right. So the high Varroa might colony that's getting robbed to me is a right is a mite bomb. Is a mite bomb right? Well yes and no. Well uh, the colony that's doing the robbing eventually overwhelms itself and becomes a uh, very heavily infested and dying colony itself yet the the adjacent colonies in my yard for this colony that's tanking uh, they're not suffering um, the you know uh, hitchhiker varroa or the explosion of varroa or the bees carrying varroa to adjacent colonies. They're just, it's just not happening that way. Right. Now I, I understand your, your, your strict definition. My definition is a little looser and I don't know that it really matters. I think that in the end there's transmission of those mites um, that are happening between colonies. Um, and I think that you know, as you're mentioning, it's not necessarily the same colonies. It's often, and I, I said there's a tragic flaw in bees. I, I was saying that about my EFB this year. My biggest colony coming out of the winter is the one who ended up with um, EFB. And it's because there was a lot of crap going on in the, in the area. And they were so strong, they went and started robbing everybody else around. And so they brought this back. So there's a tragic flaw, I feel, um, you know, from bees that the strong goes and robs the weak and oftentimes end up weakening themselves in the process, in the process of in here, it's about mites, but it could be about any other diseases, right? Planting the seeds of their own demise. 
Exactly. So I find that kind of interesting. But we had a huge issue here two years ago in the in the fall. My mentor fell prey to it. He oxalic acid everything in late, eight, late in October, like he always does. And then he went fishing. And then he lost about 70% of his colonies that year. And, you know, looking back the following spring, I said, what the heck did you do? When did you treat? He says, I treated in October like I always do. I said, oh, my Randy, I should have said something. It, another Randy. I said, you know, I ended up having to redo another one because I did a, a, a monitored in November and there was a huge spike um, because all colonies were getting reinfested. It was a huge spike in mites like in November here in Michigan, which is very, very late. And, you know, you would not necessarily know about that. So, um, so this reinfestation issue is a very, very a dangerous one. And, and, and at times, if you don't monitor, you don't know that. You treat, you think you're okay, and you move on. And I, that's one of the things that I really like about the program is it makes you treat, it makes you see what your colony numbers are. And if you do decide to do something, then you have another test afterwards. So oftentimes people say, oh, I'm not going to monitor, I'm just going to treat. And so they just treat, but really they don't know if their treatment is working number one, because they don't have a monitoring number before and after to compare. And so I think that that's a very important lesson also in monitoring is that you need to monitor before and after so that you know if your, pro your, 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 um, your product is working. You know, I have poor luck with formic acid here. 50% of my colonies responds well with it. The other 50, it seems like it doesn't do anything. Or as Jim was saying earlier, it's because, you know, they keep bringing back Varroa as fast as I can put the formic acid uh, pad on. But if I didn't monitor, I would not know that. I would think I'm all set because I treat it. And, and that, that's, uh, that's very uh, dangerous because it doesn't always work or they get reinfested or for whatever reasons, Varroa numbers are still high. So I think that that monitoring before and after is really, really important for all these different reasons that Jerry and Jim were talking about. Any other questions or comments? And complete silence. <laughs> but what I have noticed is that uh, of the 25 or 26 or 27 that uh, were through most of the program, just about all of them are still hanging on the uh, discussion. Right, which lasted as long as the program. <laughs> And went way, way different places than the program, right? I do have a question. And the question is, uh, is how do I get hold of a recording? I missed the beginning and I would love to watch this whole thing from the beginning. Send email to VP. At Thank LMBs. you. Thank you. Some point. Uh, did you mind if we put this on our uh, YouTube channel as well? Is that so? Is your YouTube channel open to the whole public, or is it open just to your members? I believe it's to the whole public. Is that, is that correct? I guess that's, I guess that's okay. <laughs> it just seems like there was a lot of discussion on my own opinion and on this, but yeah, sure. <laughs> as long as everybody know, hopefully they listen all the way to the end. As long as everybody knows that you know. The presentation on Sentinel was really me wearing my BIP hat. And, and then the discussion that followed was me chatting. We can also have them edit out down to just the. the... Oh, yeah, maybe that would be a good idea, Jim. And who do I, I can I just put some work on someone? <laughs> to who do you email? VP. Okay. It goes to Jerry. So I guess the big question comes from me is, um, will I be seeing a Sentinel participant from the Oakland <laughs> Beekeepers Club next year? Or perhaps even this year, if I can get, somebody said that, you know, is there any way we can sign up for this year? I think we should consider, I mean, we probably have to talk about it with the with the board and then the membership, but consider like trying to use some funds from the club to um, to do like a 12 hive set and then get 
you know, a few beekeepers who are willing to do this and divide it up amongst, I guess you have to have four in your apiary in order to really participate. So not anymore. They are really loose about that now. But I will tell you that depending on if, of course, if you only have two colonies, you can't do more than two. But um, depending on the size of your operation, like four is really a minimum for significantly uh, uh, for significant data to really. Right. So if it was one person, you you have to do four. But if we did the club and we were to divide it up and I don't know, let's say we want a sampling of regions in our club, we could, you know, send it out to six or 12 different beekeepers and have them monitor one or two hives in their apiary. Right. Depending so on how been, diligent. What we've been doing for that. So there's an app now. And so you would have like this one user on the app. And then everybody would have to have that same user and password to go in to uh, record the data for each mm -hmm. of the colonies that they do. Yeah. Right. Anyway, maybe we could talk about that, Jim, and see if that's of interest. Volunteer. Yeah. <laughs> Volunteer. The cat's going to lift all those hives. <laughs> oh, yeah. Like myself, it would be, we normally would do like 12. Is that the standard number? What do you guys normally do? So uh, the program started with eight. Um, I did eight for years because eight, uh, according to Katie Lee's paper, eight is a um, statistically significant representation of a yard. So it's either eight or 10%. And that's what we do for the tech transfer team in the commercial um, uh, uh, world. And so when we started the Sentinel Apiary program, we decided to do eight. Well, we ran against the, you know, a lot of backyard beekeepers said, I don't have eight colonies. Can we just do four, you know? Um, so we started doing a four. So last year it was either four or eight. Mm -hmm. And then we have clubs that are coming in that say, hey, we'd love to have, you know, more than that. And can we split them? So this year we just kind of went all, um, we, we kind of let go of our idea of the eight in one apiary stationary. And we said, all right, let's just collect what we collect. And so now you can have four, eight or 12. Eight is the, really the minimum. So if you wanted to do like one for your operation, for example, we would say like eight is a minimum for one yard. If you have multiple yards, you might want to do 12 and then do four, 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 for example, or something like that. So it has to be in the same way because I move, the bees move around. So you will go down to- It black. doesn't have to be stationary anymore. Okay, so as long as it's the same high, they can, they can go around and not worry about it. Okay. Correct, that's the important thing is that you have colony tags that come with the kit. And so you need to tag your colonies and they have to be the same ones. I and then you, you will be able to write in your management, you know, um, you know, that those colonies move. They will ask you, have those colonies moved in the last month or whatever? You'll be able to say yes to that. Yeah. So this year, the, the, the tides is moving in the local area, you know, blackberries, cherries, and almonds this year. Right. So you're doing four pollination? Yeah. Uh, great. Right. Cherries, blackberries, almonds. Okay. All of those are, I, I mean, all those are pretty good pop pollinations, right? They do really well on blackberries and cherries, right? Yeah, the blackberries, they, they do well. We, you know, we, our primary is honey. So the blackberry honey is really good. And same thing with cherry honey came out really good as well. Almond honey, you can't touch. It's terrible, but, but the money's Winter! good. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but it's good for uh, building bees early yeah, on. Especially like, that time of year. Yeah. Right, exactly, exactly. That's good. It's really good. And where are you in the Central Valley, you said, Jim? No, no, I'm in I'm in Sonol. So I'm in Southern Alameda County. Okay. All right. Well, I'd love to see a couple of, of, of samples going up in California. It would be really nice. Uh, so we had a competition one year in Michigan. That's why you saw that. You, you saw all <laughs> this. <laughs> you have to give us a competition. <laughs> Right, I, you know, I was I was out in Michigan. I was going to every single club talking about this, and so I got quite a few people to participate. <laughs> and I started this in Wisconsin two years ago, and now uh, the Wisconsin club started giving scholarships. So they give a dollar, a hundred dollars off for to for ten beekeepers in 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 uh, Wisconsin to be doing this. So now we have tons of, of uh, Sentinel in Wisconsin too. So of course, you know, the data is as good as the number of participants you have, right? So it's the same thing for the survey and it's the same thing for Sentinel. So the more participants we have, 
the more conclusions we can really draw. We can do some really cool stuff with those data if we have, you know, more. We've got some people also from other clubs too. So uh, Nikki, Nikki here? Yes, I'm here. So Nikki is um, also in the San Mateo Club. And we have actually a few people in the San Mateo Club. Uh, well, we Mike also Bob was, who was uh, talking a minute ago. I'm, I'm sorry? Also Bob, who was talking a minute ago about getting the uh, the video recording. Yes, yes, yep. And then uh, we got Mike Diablo. You know, Mike was a past president of Diablo, and then Sung. I thought I saw Sung on there somewhere too. Here. He's the present uh, VP of, uh, of Diablo as well. So anyway, we've got quite a few. Maybe we can get them to uh, push a little bit. Too. Maybe that's the competition we need to do. Is like the club that gets the most <laughs> colony involved. <laughs> We have a lot of um, of uh, beekeeping associations in the Bay Area, and um, and they're very active, and they have a lot of members. Right. Yeah. I still am not understanding. Did you say that in one apiary you have to test four, or if if the club splits it up, you could do one in one apiary and right. So. Um, I'm, yeah. I'm confused my, about answer, my answer was not very clear. In the old days, we would have said, no, you need to do a certain number. Now we're a, a lot more loosey-goosey. If a club wants to purchase a 12 colony kit, they can separate them however they want. It's just that one data point in one apiary is not very representative. So scientifically speaking, we say, you know, if you're, if you're monitoring this one colony that's very low Varroa, it doesn't necessarily tell you if the rest of your apiary is low Varroa or vice versa. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's dangerous to just make decisions, management decisions on only one colony that you sample for. So that's the reason for doing multiple samples in one apiary is to have a better representation of what you have. But if you have only two colonies, you can't do more than that, right? So that makes sense. So we're just saying that scientifically speaking, you have to be careful. Let's say your apiary has 20 colonies and you only take one sample. Don't make your decisions about your 20 colonies according to only the data of that one sample because that's not representative of your yard. Does that make any sense, Nikki? Yeah, and um, I also think that uh, we shouldn't just think about the um, beekeeping associations or guilds uh, ponying up the money. We could also have individuals who, who do some of that. Um, I mean, I, I think this is data that, you know, I try to collect and um, it probably would do it more rigorously if it was part of the Sentinel program. So that's pretty interesting. Right. Um, you know, so. Yeah, and I think you're, you're right. So I used to do the egg calling because that's what it was. And then two years ago, I sold a bunch of colonies and I got out of the campus. So I just took a four colony kit. And let me tell you, the four colony kit is so easy after you've done eight. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, it's a breeze. And it, it, it's really, you know, at the time I had 12 colonies. So by doing a four colony kit, I was basically sampling, you know, a third of my apiary, which 30%, which was very representative. And so four colonies is really easy to do. Um, it, you know, it's, it's, and it's representative. And I, I just thought it was really worth it money wise and, and time wise. I thought that that was really great. Um, and I am telling you it, when you consider the price of the program or the program, I can guarantee that that will pay off in the end. It did for me, like, many times. And so now I just participate because I feel like that's kind of part of my beekeeping gig. But, um, you know, I, I, I have, I winter more colonies. I end up with stronger colonies in the spring. I split, I have more bees that I know what to do with. Um, and, and I end up selling bees, which I never thought I ever would. I sell a couple of nukes every year and <laughs> well, well pays for the program all by itself. So for me, that was that was a, a big thing that, you know, it was a big seller. So now I feel like I have to buy into the Seven Sentinel APRA program because that's, you know, kind of I feel kind of guilty for having all these bees. <laughs> well maybe, <laughs> maybe maybe I can visit you there in Michigan because you're living very close to my brother and my mother right now. And once your viral loads in Michigan go down a little bit. <laughs> 
<laughs> I'll be. I'll see your map. <laughs> <laughs> I'll be going to visit. Yeah, <laughs> you can come to my backyard. They just, went, they just went to Holland, Michigan for Mother's Day. <laughs> oh, that's great! Yeah, I'm like 25 minutes away. I'm I'm on the lake shore too. I'm in Grand Haven, and so and I have a couple colonies in my backyard, and I have like all this like bee food, and you know I'm just it's kind of like my little heaven here. So you're welcome to stop by anytime. Sounds I, great. I bet find that out that's more that. about, find out more about the beekeeping around that area. Yeah, yeah. It's a really good place. Michigan is a good place to do beekeeping. I remember my first time seeing Randy Oliver. Um, at the time, I was just a groupie. I, I didn't know him very well. I didn't. And it was my first talk from him. And he kept talking about pollen patties in the fall and pollen patties, patties in the fall. And I'm like, Randy, I, I said, I tried to give my bees pollen patties in the fall. I said, they won't take it. And he looks at me and he says, where do you live? You know, <laughs> <laughs> he doesn't go by three different, he says, where do you live? I said, Michigan. He says, well, that's why. And I'm like, that's why what? <laughs> I still didn't get it, right? That was at the beginning. And I'm like, that's why what? He says, Michigan is pollen heaven, honey. I'm like, it is? <laughs> no idea so randy the guy from california is the one who told me about how my state was the pollen heaven so michigan is a good place for bees it all depends <laughs> where you are it all depends where you are right right exactly exactly yeah even, Florida is very different. even in california <laughs> yeah absolutely absolutely i have to uh i have i i now have like a little route and i can never we're so busy when we go to California almonds and we work like, you know, it's just, it's just like bees, bees, bees all day long and alcohol washes and it just doesn't stop. And there's all these places I want to go and visit and all these people I want to go and meet and I just never have the time. So I'll have to take a week off in the almonds at one point if that exists. <laughs> yeah, I actually have a sister-in-law that lives very close by to you, I think. She's in Oakland County, so Oakland Oakland Bee Club is Alameda in Oakland County. County, right? It's Alameda County. <laughs> okay. It's like Grand Rapids, you know. It's not okay. it's not Grand Rapids County. <laughs> Got it. Got it. <laughs> hey, Anne, let me ask, what does a five frame nook of bees fetch in uh, Michigan? Oh, mine or somebody else's? Well, I'm sure yours are top notch. So let's start with yours. Well, no, I, I am a, I'm a terrible salesperson. I sell my honey too cheap. All the beekeepers get mad at me because they say I should sell my honey more expensive. And you know, a couple of years ago, I sold my nukes for 150. So I kept doing it, and people are like, "Are you kidding me? This should be like 225 now." So I think they go for 225, 200, 225. Okay. Um, but I, I don't. I, I can't sell something. It's just really kind of hard for me. I'm like, they're, they're my little, I don't know. I'm, do you, a, I'm a hobby beekeeper at heart. What do you get per pound for your honey? So I get $7 per pound. Well, that's way too low. I know. Although here in Michigan, we have a lot. And so um, like at the coffee shop here, the guy at the coffee shop sells his for $8 a, a pound. So it's not that low. Um, but then, you know, if you buy three pounds at a time, I'll sell it to you for $6 a pound, right? I'm, I'm terrible. I'm, I'm, I'm really not meant to be a business person. That's why I work for a nonprofit organization. <laughs> I'm terrible at business. Thank you. <laughs> what, what's your honey selling for over there? Oh, 15 to $20 a pound. Uh, certain uh, people get upwards of $30 a pound. Robert McAmey has a, a, a certain business model in San Francisco. He harvests a few frames from a particular neighborhood, extracts it and bottles it, and sells it back into the neighborhood for like $30 a pound. <laughs> My neighbors all get free honey here. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, I really need to change my. <laughs> yeah, I really need to change my business model. I guess. Our, our retail, our retail sale is sixty standard per pound. Oh wow. Well, it might be it might be more expensive to keep your colonies throughout the season since you don't have like a a winter where they're completely dormant all throughout the winter, since you have to probably feed pollen patties in the fall. 
you know, that sort of thing. My guess is it probably is more expensive for you to produce that honey. Well, I classify the folks who do farmer's market sales as different from the, uh, the typical backyard beekeeper who sells in the neighborhood. Right. Because the, if you're doing a farmer's market, you've got to pay a fee to the host and you probably have to have the business license and the inspections and a whole lot of overhead that should justify the high price that they get. And a lot of us have like zero overhead. Right. So, right. you know, why should we just, how can we justify charging the same uh, as someone who has a very high overhead? Right. Right. You can see that. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, no, Michigan is probably one of the cheapest because we do have quite a bit of honey here. So I do know that um, I sell it cheaper than I should, but I do know that Michigan is also a lot cheaper than many other places. We have beautiful wildflower honey, but I mean, it's not like we have like sourwood or like, um, I guess we could make blackberry too a little bit, but not that much. Um, that is beautiful honey. So you probably have some specialty honeys also. Yeah. Uh, we do the cherry, the blackberry, and again, blackberry is probably my favorite. But, uh, it's huge. Interestingly, yeah, it's very popular too. Yeah. In the East Bay, from uh, Richmond down to Hayward, uh, about a hundred years ago or 110 years ago, there were a lot of eucalyptus planted, and that brings uh, in a butterscotchy, buttery kind of uh, honey that's uh, pretty typical. Um, throughout the whole range here. And it's a, it's a substantial, when it's flowing, it's a substantial uh, component of honey that's produced. When I grew up, we had a special bottle of eucalyptus honey that my mom would buy every year. I was in Canada, right? I'm from Canada originally. And, um, and, and that was for when I had a cold. And so for me, eucalyptus honey is like this, this, you know, this honey to make my lungs breathe easier or something. I don't know. It was, it had like this magical power. <laughs> it's one of my favorite just because of that. And then in the summer we have, and later summer we have eucalyptus or not, sorry, we have fennel and anise, which gives a spicy uh, characteristic to yep. the honey. Yeah. Oh yeah. You do have some really great, um, Specialty honeys, that's for sure. That's that that probably fetches a, a better price too. So yeah, that's really great. Yeah, five for nukes, how much do they go for in your area? I, I think they go for, I mean, I, I sell mine for 180, so but I'm not in that business. I, I start off at 175 pre-sale and it works its way up to 200 total if by this time of year. Right. Okay. I get I get 170 for mine uh, and 125 for um, medium sized frames, and I've had really good results selling the smaller ones. Well, that's where that that's good. I think that's pretty much what it is here. Um, I've just heard some crazy numbers this year, but um, I don't know that people sell it for that. Like I would never sell it for that. So, sounds pretty reasonable. Sounds good. And and how how do you have like a, a running count of colony losses in your in your club? Like, do you know if you you know if you had a good year or is it like all over? Some did, some didn't. We don't have any any real data for that. Um, so it's just kind of you know, these type of meetings where I'll talk about it. <coughs> um, I I track my own, but I don't think. Uh, and mine changes by year. Last well, year with, the, with the amount that your honey sells, I think that would be easy. That's that easy to participate in Sentinel, right, Nikki? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'll, I'll definitely, I'll definitely participate. Right. Um, so send me the if you have any other questions related to the program or whatever. Um, I, I have the I'm not as I said I don't run that program at BIP. Somebody else does. I hope she's um, happy with the recording when she sees it. Um, <laughs> but if you have any questions, I'm you know you're welcome to send them to me, and I can put you in contact with the coordinator of the program, and then you can. <coughs> it was great chatting with you. I felt like we were kind of, you know, sitting somewhere either at a restaurant or, you know, having a drink together and just had a nice long discussion. That was great. We're all, we're all trying to get used to it. <laughs> yeah.
Yeah, I miss that quite a bit, you know, when you go to conferences and when you go to these talks, that's what you do. You normally go and, you know, have these conversations outside of the presentation. And I really miss that because on Zoom, it's usually you do your thing, a couple of questions and you're done. So you guys have really made it possible to, you know, feel more like a, a, a in-person meeting. So thank you for that. Yeah, so yeah, I, I do miss the I do miss the conferences. It'd be nice to get that those rolling here. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Oh, we we thank you very much for uh, uh, contributing your evening to uh, our our entertainment. <laughs> and yours to mine. That was really great. <laughs>